I think I'm on now. Yes, brilliant. Um, great, let's, let's pray again as we begin. Father, we do thank you so much uh, for your words, your words of life. Father, thank you that as we receive and believe them that we have life in your name. And Father, we pray that we would hear you speak to us this morning in your word as I preach it. Lord, please, by your spirit, would you be uh, convicting us, encouraging us, assuring us. In Jesus' name, amen. A slightly uh, strange uh, introductory question this morning, but I I wonder if you've ever spent time thinking about what food uh, you would choose if you knew it was to be your final meal. Um, I expect some of you have got something in your head straight away. Um, I enjoyed a delicious uh, chicken dish on Wednesday night at our uh, social for our missional community. But um, sadly, it is actually a real choice, isn't it, that some people do have to make. There's been lots of interests uh, through, through the years about prisoners on death row uh, and what they choose for their last meal. Uh, some choose quite extravagant uh, plates if they're granted. Uh, others often go for comfort food. Apparently fried chicken and french fries is a, is a popular one. But more seriously, if you knew that your time of death was approaching, what would be your final request? What might be your final prayer that you'd make to our Heavenly Father? Because what you prayed in that moment would really reveal what you care most about, wouldn't it? Perhaps for some of those on uh, death row, it might be a prayer, a desperate prayer for a final reprieve. Uh, You do hear of those sometimes, don't you? A last minute legal challenges that come through uh, just in time. Or maybe for us, um, it would be a prayer for those that we love and would leave behind. Well, today, what we get to overhear is the Lord Jesus' death row prayer. It's the night before he will purposefully walk towards his death on a cross. And what is on his heart at this moment as he's about to die. Uh, What is it that he cares most for? What's he praying for? Well, there's two things. Firstly, it's us. He wants to give us eternal life. But also, it's God. God's glory. And more than anything, Jesus wants to glorify God, but to do this by giving us eternal life. And that's our first point to just remember this morning uh, that Jesus glorifies God by giving us eternal life. Jesus glorifies God by giving us eternal life. I should have said it's worth keeping your uh, Bibles open on that page so you can follow along some of these verses, page 1085. Uh, but Jesus prays in verse 2. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. See, Jesus' whole reason for living is to uh, glorify the Father. And yet that's achieved through the Father glorifying him. And of course, as the eternal Son, Jesus has always been glorious. He's always shared in God's glory. If you glance down at verse 5, Uh, in your Bibles, you can see uh, Jesus is praying. He wants to be uh, back in the Father's presence with the glory that he shared with him before the world began. Jesus has always been glorious. And yet in verse 4, before he returns to his heavenly glory, well, he first glorifies the Father through his work on earth. If you glance down at verse 4, Uh, Although Jesus prays as if his work is already completed, his work on earth includes what he's about to face, uh, the strangest of work, um, his hour. Jesus prays, Father, the hour has come. And we've heard it this morning already, but the hour in uh, John's gospel is his way, Jesus' way of speaking of his own death. You can see that back in chapter 12. I'll put this on the screen for you there. 
And Jesus says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And then Jesus prays again, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. See, far from praying for a last-minute reprieve, Jesus is saying, the hour has come. And as much as we know that it fills him with dread, uh, this is what he has come for. This is what he cares most about, his mission. And it will bring God great glory. And that's because the cross is the clearest expression of God's love and justice. That the cross is the purest moment of self-giving love that the world has ever seen and that the world ever will see. And the cross is the means by which Jesus justly gives us eternal life. As he, the Lamb of God, takes away the sin of the world as he faces God's wrath for our sin. Verse 2 in your Bibles, Jesus prays. He says, For you granted him, the Son, authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. But what Jesus wants more than anything is that he, the Son, glorifies the Father by giving us eternal life. So do you see, Jesus has tied the glory of God to our salvation. Just think how sure and how secure that makes our eternal life with him. He staked his name and the Father's name on giving it to us. And what's more, did you see that Jesus, he has all authority to give it? Verse 2, the reason that he can glorify God in in this way, the reason that Jesus' death uh, is the way to life, is that he has authority over all people, literally all flesh to then give eternal life to all those that the Father has given him. We know from the the rest of John's Gospel that uh, God so loves the world. Uh, Jesus' mission is to the world. And so God, the Father, has given Jesus a a worldwide multitude to then bestow this um, eternal life uh, on. This is abundant giving from the Father and abundant giving from Jesus. And Jesus, he's not promising something above his pay grade. He really does have authority, all authority to give this eternal life to us, to all those the Father has given him. You might not be into um, politics, uh, many aren't, uh, but like it or not, uh, in the news at the moment, we're hearing a lot, aren't we, about the first hundred days or so, is it, of a new Labour government in power? I'll leave it to you to assess um, how they're doing. But, but in all the new kind of policy announcements, uh, you always wait for someone at the top uh, to, uh, to announce it, don't you? Uh, if you? If you hear of a kind of a junior civil servant or someone and a rumour spreading of a U-turn, say on the winter fuel, fuel payments or something, uh, well, we don't really listen to that until someone like King Keir uh, comes out uh, and confirms it um, or denies it. Well, Jesus, he has unparalleled authority over the whole earth all people and he uses it to give the best gift of eternal life to us but what is eternal life well hopefully you are paying attention uh, throughout the whole service and uh, bible bite size because Jesus defines it for us doesn't he in verse 3 he says now this is eternal life I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I wonder what you would have said before you walked in this morning to that, or perhaps what those you know might define eternal life as. So I wonder if actually for for many people, it is that thought of life just going on forever and ever, Uh, like my son said around the table, like that ball of wool that just keeps getting unraveled. Now, there's some truth to that, isn't it? But Jesus, he doesn't mention time, does he? He mentions, uh, he defines eternal life in terms of relationship. 
Why don't we read it out again together? This is kind of like a memory verse today, isn't it? Let's read it together again. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. That would be a brilliant verse to to memorize, wouldn't it, Um, together? Eternal life is knowing the Father and Son. Uh, This is uh, Jesus finally reversing the curse at the fall. This is the relationship that God made us for back in the Garden of Eden, now finally restored, and yet actually even better. Uh, No longer shut out from God's presence, but now with intimate knowledge of the Father and the Son. Uh, These boxes again, Jesus in the Father, and us in Jesus, and Jesus in us by his Spirit. A direct access to the Father who he himself loves us. Uh, This is eternal life, relationship with God. And again, I think for lots of people, we might well assume, or others out there will assume, that eternal life, well, it starts when we get to heaven. That's where eternal life begins. But no, again, if, if this is all to do with relationship with God, well, then it must start now. Eternal life begins the moment that we believe in Jesus, in his words. I think we had this verse today already, but uh, back in John 5, Jesus says this. He says, Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. So if you are trusting in Jesus today, then you have this life now. You've already crossed over from death to life. That's already happened. And you can be certain that you have that eternal life because Jesus really wants to give it to you. And Jesus has all authority to give it to you. And the Father and Son are glorified in giving it to you. So how does Jesus give this life? How does he give this life? Because we've never met Jesus in person, have we? How does this life come to us and to the world? We're going to see that as we listen in to the rest of Jesus' prayer in 6 to 19, that Jesus ensures life for the world by sending his apostles with his word. He ensures life for the world by sending his apostles with his word. We're going to come to Jesus praying for the apostles uh, in a moment, but just to sneak into next week's passage just by one verse, uh, just to see what Jesus' big aim in all of this is. Uh, In verse 20, uh, Jesus switches who he's praying for. So Jesus prays, he says, My prayer is not for them alone, i.e. the apostles, but I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. See, Jesus' mission is to um, glorify God as he gives eternal life to a worldwide multitude. That's where Jesus wants to go. His, His mission is to the world. But actually, he's ensuring that this happens through the words of his apostles. That's why Jesus, you can see him praying just down in verse 18. He says, Father, as you sent me into the world, I've sent them into the world. So because we, who are part of the world, we come to believe and so have life through the apostles' message. Well, Jesus wants to convince us, as we overhear his prayer that the apostle's word is indeed his word that he's given them. He wants to convince us of this arrow here. And straight away we hear Jesus' confidence, I think, that he has really done this. The apostles really do uh, have received and believed his words. Now, verses 6 to 8 now. Verse 6, on, on Jesus' part, he's revealed God to them. It's all his doing. Uh, But he's done this by uh, giving them his word. 
verse 8. He says, For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. And they knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. Jesus' words are God's words, and he's given them to his apostles. It's interesting, isn't it, that although Jesus has been with them physically, in person, for all those years, actually, he says it's his word that gives them this lasting revelation that they need and that the world needs. And on the, on the apostles' part, you see that they've, they've obeyed it. They've obeyed his word, verse 6. They've accepted it. And crucially, verse 8, they have believed. Jesus prays confidently. He's ensured that his words have been truly received by the apostles. And as the apostles uh, believe his words, did you notice as well that they now know God and Jesus whom he sent? They know that with certainty. Uh, This is eternal life happening for them. Jesus' word really does work. Uh, They're the first to receive his words and so the life that Jesus wants to give the whole world. But of course, they're just the next step. Jesus' mission is to the world. And yet it's a dangerous one. It's a dangerous mission. Have a look down at verse 14. Jesus says, uh, he prays again, I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. See, as the apostles, they kind of receive his word and they're in some way immediately separated uh, from the world. They don't belong to the world any more than Jesus did. Uh, Jesus prays a similar thing uh, down in verse 17. He says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Uh, That word sanctify, that can just mean set aside for holy use, uh, reserved for God's service. And Jesus sets the apostles aside by his words, separating them from the world, and yet he sends them back into the world. And it's a hostile world. It's a world that hates Jesus and will hate his followers. But actually it's, it's worse than that, because they don't just face the world but they face the devil as well. Verse 15, Jesus prays again, My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. See, as these apostles take this vital, life-giving message into the world, their mission is fraught with danger uh, from the world, but also from the devil as well. And so they need protection. Jesus has delivered his message to them, but now he needs to protect the messengers. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the true story of the heroic carrier pigeons that were used to deliver vital messages during World War I. Well, one such a pigeon was called Cher Ami. Any French speakers in here? Was that an okay pronunciation? Cher Ami, our friend. Yeah. Um, so, uh, while atta- well, anyway, the Americans, while attacking a heavily fortified um, German line in northern France, there was 545 American soldiers who advanced too far and became trapped in a ravine where they were uh, kind of weathering enemy fire, but also American artillery fire as well. And they were trapped. The Americans didn't know they were there. And uh, legend has it that um, all other means of communication were cut off. Uh, Their only hope of survival was this one remaining pigeon, Cher Ami. And so uh, the US Army Major Charles Whittlesey, he frantically scribbled a note that he found and folded inside a canister and attached it to Cher Ami's leg. And as the division watched Cher Ami take flight, a German bomber blasted Cher Ami out of the sky. But incredibly, (laughs) the wounded bird struggled back into the air and flew the 25 miles back to the American base. Cher Ami arrived, blinded in one eye, with a deep wound across his chest uh, and a canister dangling from what remained of his leg. Uh, And inside was that message, the crucial message to stop the Americans bombing their own men. Uh, Why have I told you that story? (laughs) Well, those soldiers, they were saved despite their poor messenger being left exposed to enemy fire. But imagine how much more certain they'd have been of their rescue if their messenger pigeon had been protected. Do you realize I've inadvertently likened the apostles to pigeons with that illustration? That's not intended. But uh, Jesus' messengers, his apostles, they were protected at every point along the way covered in prayer by Jesus who has all all authority 
uh, protected by the name, the powerful name of the Father. Imagine these disciples hearing Jesus pray. He prayed it so they could hear it. He prayed it so that we can hear it. Imagine the, the comfort that it brought them as they're being sent into this hostile world. But also the certainty that it gives us that they really did make it with Jesus' message intact. And the word that they carried, it doesn't just save hundreds of lives in one ravine, but a worldwide multitude that the Father has given to Jesus. Jesus' words are the way that he gives the world, us, eternal life, saving us from the judgment to come, as we've already heard today. And as we listen into Jesus' prayer, he wants us to be sure that he has left no stone unturned in ensuring that his revelation of God has reached us as he intends. He's delivered the message. He's protected the messengers so that as we believe in him, through their word, we too can have certainty of this eternal life and joy in him. John who wrote this gospel, uh, he himself an apostle, um, he himself one of those messengers that Jesus sent. Well, he says at the end of this gospel, he said, look, I've, I've written these signs down for you. I've given you Jesus' words so that you may believe and have life in his name. God wants us as Christians to have certainty in this. As we're assured that these words in the Bible are, are true and trustworthy, well, so that we can be assured that we really do have the eternal life that Jesus wants to give, that he has given to us as Christians. And as we're assured of this life, well, Jesus wants us to enjoy it. Remember, it's not like Jesus, he doesn't give us something and then just leave us to get, get on with it. No, he, he gives us himself. Eternal life is knowing the Father and knowing the Son, whom, Jesus, whom the Father has sent. We have that ongoing life now. Jesus is glorified not just in giving it to us but in us living it out and enjoying it. We've heard so much haven't we in these chapters about the privilege of relationship that we can enjoy with God now in the day of the Spirit and because these words are true we can we can go back over them perhaps even put our names there. Take uh, chapter 14 verse 20 on that day Mark, Alex, Jonathan, Johanna, on that day you will know that I am in my Father and you are in me and I in you. That day is today. Take 1626. And that day, Nathan, Lottie, Julie, Esther, you will ask in my name and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and believed that I came from God that day is today and as we've seen haven't we being, having this eternal life living it out means loving and obeying loving and obeying Jesus' words letting his words abide in us so Jesus says to us today all of us uh, Grace Church as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. This is the eternal life that Jesus wants us to live out and enjoy. Eternal life that is started now already. Uh, and so Jesus wants to enjoy it by his spirit through his words. But also know that the future, the future is certain as well. My son wasn't altogether wrong, was he, with his answer that it's life going on and on uh, forever. Jesus' promise, uh, right at the beginning of this section where we started a few months ago in 14.3, says, uh, Jesus says, and if I go to prepare a place for you, well, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. One day soon, Jesus will return and all those the Father has given him, that worldwide multitude, he will bring with him to be in glory. A relationship that will go on forever. Jesus 
glorifies God as he gives us eternal life by sending his apostles with his words. But just as we finish, let's remember that that is a living and active word, a spirit-filled word that is all about Jesus, all about Jesus' work, his hour, his work of death on our behalf, his work of resurrection to life and ascension. See, even his precious messengers, the apostles, they needed Jesus to die for their sin, just as much as we do. Jesus finished his prayer by praying this in verse 19. He said, For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. See, before Jesus could give them life through his word, before he could send them with his word, Jesus first set himself aside for holy use. And what holier use was there? What greater glory could Jesus bring than by going to his hour, going to his death on their behalf, his death on our behalf, his death and resurrection that brings God glory and gives us eternal life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that if we have trusted in your word, in Jesus' words, that we do have eternal life. Thank you that we can be certain of that, Lord. Please help us as we are certain of the words that you gave to your apostles for us, that we be certain of our life in you, that we would enjoy it and live it out. Well, please help us to abide in Jesus letting his word abide in us. In Jesus' name, amen.